deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. With the completion of our Who's God series in which we contrasted and compared the differences between the alien Yahweh deity of the Torah with our Christian God as revealed to us only through Christ, the path has now been prepared to take the next step in our journey through the world of pre-Nicene Christianity. And it's a world that's heavily forested with editing, annotation, and, as we learned in our last episode about the Damnatio Memoriae, it's a world plagued with erasures and deletions. And they are just up ahead in the clearing, perched on a dais, are two Bibles, one being the very first Christian Bible of 144 AD with its single gospel, the Gospel of the Lord and original ten epistles, and the other being today's Judeo-Christian Bible, which was cobbled and stapled together hundreds of years later and finally published very late in the 4th century. That would be 382 AD, to be precise. Now, we notice there are several immediate and rather jarring differences between the two, not the least of which is that today's Judeo-Christian Bible somehow magically inflated from one single gospel in ten books to four gospels plus Acts, an extra 62 books, and just to make sure they didn't leave anything out of their new narrative, they even stapled an extra religion to the front of it in the form of the Torah, which they then renamed to the Old Testament to keep it from sounding too alien. Now, casting aside these obvious differences, we step closer and begin slowly turning the pages of Paul's epistles, comparing the original version found in the first Bible with those we see in the Judeo-Christian Bible, and it becomes apparent that the original has 10 epistles, but the other has 13 epistles. And these extra letters of unknown origin in the form of First and Second Timothy and Titus. And of the 10 remaining, we notice the titles are the same, but in many places the words have been changed or even removed outright. In some places, entire chapters have either been removed or created anew from whole cloth. And now the birds around us begin to chirp a little louder, perhaps adding to our confusion. And shaking our head, we ask, why are they so different from each other? Who would do this? What is being gained? Qui bono? So we stop and remain still, silently praying to our Father to send his Holy Spirit and guide us to help us discern truth from this apparently confusing scenario. Hmm... And looking back down at the dais, we see the titles. The names of the epistles are the same, but what's this? In the original Bible, we see a prologue, a small paragraph above each of the ten original epistles. And each prologue is describing the people, events, and circumstances that surrounded the church that received a personal letter from Paul. Isn't that interesting? Now, let's look at the very first one as we find it above Galatians. Quote, The Galatians are Greeks. They at first accepted the word of truth from the apostle, but after his departure they were tempted by false apostles to be converted to the law and circumcision. The apostle calls them back to the faith of truth, writing to them from Ephesus. Unquote. And we notice that there's a different one above each epistle. And upon reading the prolongs, what, what do we notice? What, what effect does it have? And the answer to that can be given to you by any grade school teacher. The prologues, you see, give us context. And with this context, we are able to not just read Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. We now have context. Who? Why? What happened? And suddenly, this isn't just some generic letter written by anyone to just anybody. Now we have a more complete picture. Now we have context. And now that we have context regarding the epistles, maybe I should give you some context about the prologues. After all, it's only fair. Now, these prologues were written no later than 144 AD by Marcion of Sinope. He was the son of the Bishop of Pontus, who, using his fleet of merchant vessels, retraced the route of Paul's missionary journeys and visited all of his churches, 
collecting his gospel of the Lord in the original ten epistles. He then transcribed all of it into codex format, or what we know today as books, and compiled then the first Christian Bible. And it was written in Greek, by the way. This Bible and the prologues were later acquired by St. Jerome and used as his source material to translate everything into Latin, and with it, his version of the Latin Vulgate. Now, you might be saying to yourself, Darren, you sound pretty confident about all this. How do you know this? And the answer to that is because the Vatican Library was kind enough to make it public as part of their document digitization campaign a few years ago in which they scanned and uploaded vast amounts of all of their manuscripts. And you can bet we were pretty pleased to have found this particular batch. Now, if you're watching this episode on PCTV, you'll see a series of images naming Marcion as the source for the original ten epistles and the prologues. The prologues themselves are referred to as argumentum in the notes section. And if you're listening on PCRN Radio or one of the podcast platforms, I'll have a link in the show notes so you can have a little look-see yourself. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Marcion of Sinope was canonized earlier this year by the Marcionite Christian Church, and he's now known as Saint Marcion. And you can learn more about him at marcionitechurch.org, and we certainly have much to thank him for. And with that generous helping of context, let us now read the rest of the prologues, and as we do so, see if you can spot a recurring theme in many of them. And by the way, if you'd like to follow along as we do this, you can download a free copy of the First Christian Bible for free at theveryfirstbible.org. Okay, after Galatians, we turn to Romans. Quote, the Romans are in the regions of Italy. They had been reached by false apostles, and under the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, they were led away into the law and the prophets. The apostle calls them back to the true evangelical faith writing to them from Corinth, unquote. Now Corinthians, quote, The Corinthians are Achaeans, and they similarly heard from the apostles the word of truth, and then were subverted in many ways by false apostles, some led away by the verbose eloquence of philosophy, others by a sect of the Jewish law. He calls them back to the true and evangelical wisdom, writing to them from Ephesus through Timothy, unquote. 2 Corinthians, quote, After penitence was made, he writes a consolatory letter to them from Troas, and in praising them, he exhorts them on to better things, unquote. Now Philemon, which, by the way, is the shortest of the epistles, quote, He composes a familiar letter to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus, his servant. He writes to him, however, from Rome, from prison, unquote. Moving to Thessalonians, quote, The Thessalonians are Macedonians in Christ Jesus who, after the word was accepted, still persisted in the faith and the persecution by their fellow citizens. Furthermore, they did not receive those things which were said by the false apostles. The apostle praises them, writing to them from Athens, unquote. Now, 2 Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians he writes and makes note to them concerning the last times and of the detection of the adversary. He writes to them from Athens. Moving on to Laodiceans, which you know as Ephesians, quote, The Laodiceans are Asians. They persisted in the faith after the word of truth was accepted. The apostle praises them, writing to them from the city of Rome, from prison, through Tychicus the deacon, unquote. Next up are the Colossians. Quote, the Colossians, they too are Asians, just as the Laodiceans, and they themselves had been reached by pseudo-apostles. Nor did the apostle himself approach them, but even them he corrects through an epistle. For they had heard the word from Archippus, who also accepted the ministry to them. The apostle, therefore, already arrested, writes to them from Ephesus, unquote. And finally, we wrap it up with Philippians, quote, The Philippians are Macedonians. They persisted in the faith after the word of truth was accepted, nor did they receive false apostles. The apostle praises them, writing to them from Rome, from prison, through Epaphroditus, unquote. Now, how was all that for context? Pretty good? 
Are you ready for the bonus round of context? Well, all ten of these churches were established by Paul under the collective authority and command of all the apostles, including Peter, and they were established in a special mission with special orders. You see, these new churches and the people who worshipped in them had nothing to do with the Jews or anything called Yahweh. And, by the way, you won't find the name Yahweh in any New Testament on this planet. Now, how do I know about Paul and his churches had nothing to do with Jews? Well, the answer is because Galatians 2.7 makes it crystal clear. Quote, James and Cephas and John, those reputed to be pillars, the right hands of fellowship they gave to me and Barnabas, that we should go unto the nations, but they unto the circumcision. Unquote. Now, did you hear what I just read to you? Paul is to preach to and convert the Gentiles with the gospel of the Lord. That means you and me and everyone else in the known world. But Peter and James are to preach to and convert just the Jews. And as an aside, it's likely that Peter used Matthew's heavily Judaized version of a gospel for his assigned mission. Let me cut through the haze and put this into perspective. Two different apostles, two different gospels, two different audiences, and two completely different missions. Let's read it again so there's no confusion. Quote, James and Cephas and John, those reputed to be pillars, the right hands of fellowship they gave to me and Barnabas, that we should go unto the nations, but they unto the circumcision. Unquote. And by the way, you'll find this exact verse in both the first Christian Bible of 144 AD and in today's Judeo-Christian Bible. These are the facts, and they are undisputed. Now, why do I bring this up? Remember in the beginning, I asked you to keep in mind that we might be seeing a recurring theme with these prologues. Well, that theme would be the fact that these newly established Christian churches were beset upon by false prophets, Jews, and Judaizers, spiritual terrorists whose sole mission was to subvert, corrupt, and destroy these fledgling churches. And we read this not only in St. Marcion's prologues, but in the very epistles written by the Apostle Paul himself. Let's read it together in Galatians 1, 4-5. And, and as we do this, you can feel his anguish at what was being done to his churches and the new Christians. Quote, I marvel that ye are so quickly changed from him that called you in the grace unto a different gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Unquote. Now let those words sink in and look at this map of the region. I want you to consider something. These ten churches span the breadth and width of the entire Roman Empire. Turkey, Syria, Greece, Italy, Asia Minor. We're talking about a massive geographical area. And yet, somehow, somehow, these Judaizers and false prophets were able to target and attempt to subvert all of these churches. Now, was there a special hit squad that traveled across the Roman Empire looking for new Christian churches to corrupt? Yeah, sure, maybe. But let's use Occam's razor here instead. What do we know? We know that every one of these cities also had a synagogue within it. So now we know a little more about adding context and how it applies to our Bible and Christianity in general. We find that context is the companion of truth. Will we discover that it is also the enemy of the liar? Now, it takes a very discerning and astute person to detect when another is taking something out of context, particularly when it is done in a very subtle way. Now, I would posit that taking things out of context is actually more insidious than outright lies. In past episodes, we've shown you examples of it as we contrasted and compared the first Christian Bible with the later Judeo-Christian version. Consider that when someone expresses an outright lie, we could say that with a little research, we will know fairly quickly that it is, in fact, a lie. It doesn't last long or go very far. So, in essence, an outright lie simply implodes and is not particularly subtle in its deceit. It's the Joe Sixpack amateur hour level of lie. 
However, when we take things out of context, often the majority of what is expressed is actually true, apart from maybe a few tiny details. And this is why it is far more cunning, more deceptive and manipulative to take things out of context. You see, it's much more difficult for the reader or listener to recognize that what is being expressed is not actually true, because in many cases, it is very close to what the truth is or represents. But due to the distortion, it now contains no truth whatsoever. It's a far more sophisticated version of lying. We call that satanic-level lying. In fact, the Judeo-Christian version of the Bible says it better than I ever could, and we read that in John 8, 4, 4, quote, He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies, unquote. That's going to do it for the episodic content of today's program. And a reminder before you punch out, you can reconnect with the pre-Nicene Christians by reading the same Bible they did by getting a free copy at theveryfirstbible.org. Now, I need to move on to a stack of housekeeping items for regular viewers and parishioners. Now, you may have noticed a slow shift in branding from FBN to PCTV, and it's intentional. Nothing has changed regarding ownership or theological underpinnings. It's purely a branding decision. And for our purposes, it's better for us to dominate that word pre-Nicene than it is to dominate a series of words like First Bible Network, which are already taken. Um, and you'll see that if you do a Google search. It's, it's literally impossible to, to get even near to the top of that pile. And that's why the church acquired the domain prenicene.org and moved our video production to Prenicene Christian Television or PCTV. And I mention this so you have a little context on why it's happening. And related to that news... Uh, PCTV is now available on Roku, R-O-K-U, and you can add that free channel through the search box. Just type in PCTV or use the link in the show notes. Next on the stack, the new Pre-Nicene Explorer app, version 1.1, has just been released. All FBN PCTV content, radio, video, podcast, ebooks, everything on the app, in and out, no searching, all in one place. And you can get that at pre-nicene.org and click on the menu item on top. Remember the dash between pre and Nicene. There's even a link to the Marcionite Church chat room and the PCTV daily headline news videos in the Explorer app. The app is free and I use it, so it's a no-brainer. Okay, we really need to do a standalone episode just on viewer mail because it's uh, been getting quite large. So let me just knock out a couple real fast right now. Uh, on supporting the show, there's, well, there's quite a few. Um, and in answer to that, how do we support the show? We don't uh, sell anything or monetize anything, so there's really no way to support us in that way. It's not like we, you know go buy our t-shirt or buy a trinket or something. It doesn't work that way. But if you want to help us reach others, uh, you can just share the links on social media or whatever you're using. Maybe there's an outlet that allows you to rate and review our shows and content. Well, in that case, absolutely rate and review us for sure. Uh, each one helps us help others. And remember, PCTV is also on Twitter or at least until it gets banned again. Uh, it's also where we're posting those daily PCTV headline news clips, and you can find that at prenicene underscore TV for Twitter. And on YouTube, you can find us at prenicene TV, all one word. Next on the stack, Darren, is there a Marcionite Christian church in my area? And uh, the answer to that is probably not, my friend. But there may be a Marcionite meeting house near you. The pre-Nicene denominations used 
meeting houses for prayer and mass. Uh, Purpose-built church structures were uh, pretty rare back then, mainly because of the persecution they endured and having a need to stay under the radar. Um, and by the way, as the enemy of all mankind, as described in 1 Thessalonians 2.15, tightens his satanic net around the Western world today, you also may find that a meeting house might be the smart way to attend Mass and enjoy Christian fellowship. And you can find those resources for uh, meeting house locations and people on the join page of the MarcionitesChurch.org website. And by the way, as we speak, land has been acquired in El Salvador for the reconstruction of the Marcionite Church discovered in Syria in the late 1800s. And that church was made famous by the fact that it contained the world's oldest inscription in the world bearing the name of Jesus Christ carved into its doorway, which, which read, To our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Good. And it was dated 318 A.D. And I should also mention that that inscription was in Greek, the same language as our Bible. And we'll be doing a standalone episode on that as it develops. All right, next. Darren, if they do another fake plague, will the church offer religious exemptions? Uh, yes, yes, and it will mark the third year in a row of providing free religious exemptions. And a couple years ago, we did 1,436 uh, VAX exemptions. Uh, we'd like to think that those are actually lives that we help save. Next, Darren, did the Marcionites have the same mass and sacraments as other churches? And the answer is yes and no. For the most part, they're fairly similar. The Marcionite Christian Church publishes a free liturgical guide with a walkthrough for mass and all the rites and sacraments. And you can get that at theveryfirstbible.org forward slash mass dot html. Thanks for joining us. I'm Darren Kalama, praying that our Father's Holy Spirit finds and guides you always. We'll see you next time on Pre-Nicene Perspective. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective, and we invite you to learn more at theveryfirstbible.org.